praise you, Jesus. How great is our God. Now, Elizabeth's going to teach us a new song this morning, King of Kings. Um, as we were talking about it a few weeks ago, it's, I've just heard it for the first time. What an amazing song. Easy song to pick up as she sings it, leads it for us this morning. Just enter in, shut yourself in with the Lord, raise your hands towards heaven, and let's just recognize the King of Kings is here today. In the darkness we were waiting with the We're so thankful that you're King of Kings and you're Lord of Lords, and you're here this morning. We just surrender and we just submit our lives. 
to you and your will. Continue to minister to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, I welcome you here to the house of the Lord, and uh, just great to worship the Lord together. I just have a few announcements I want to share with you, and then we'll dismiss the kids to make their way downstairs. Just reminding, this being the first Sunday of the month, uh, we have communion, and so hopefully you picked up your emblems as you came in today and are prepared uh, following the message uh, this morning. Hopefully you received a bulletin. I'm sure you all received a bulletin and are aware of what is taking place in the next few weeks. A few weeks ago, I, I handed out, we handed out a survey to you, and uh, I did get a few responses. Like when I say few, I put emphasis on a few. You got the message? About three or four. So what I'd like you to do is really, really, really pray about, um, you know, this, what you, what you share with us here in the church. We really want to work together as a body. We want your ideas working together. We want to do our best to minister to you and to minister to our community and so if you could pray about that and draw some thoughts down, of course, about a month from now, I'll meet with the board, and we'll just kind of take some of your thoughts, and we'll think about and plan and dream about our future, if you could work with me on that. I appreciate that. You do have an insert, uh, you know, talking about the library. If you haven't been into our library, it's visited all the new, there's all a lot of new books, and uh, Kathy Kayon is just doing an amazing job of updating and organizing. You just want to take a moment to, to visit the library, see what's there, and make sure you take home some books and start reading. Uh, we appreciate your faithfulness in giving, of course, every week. There are off an offering plate at the back, and as you make your way out, those of you that give via envelopes, um, you can drop your envelope in that uh, offering plate. Many of you are giving online. E-transfer, we appreciate that, your faithfulness throughout the years. I do want to mention you, may mention, you may see in the bulletin there that at the end of the month, we have a special offering, October 30th, uh, a special mortgage offering. We do have two of those a year, one in the spring and one in the fall, to help uh, supplement that and cover the cost of paying for our mortgage. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few weeks, but I just wanted to make are you aware of that special offering over and above your regular tithes and offerings. I should mention also that on the first uh, Sunday uh, of October every year, there is Life Chain. And again, this is just an opportunity for the, the churches to come together in the community and really go out into the community and um, with signs declaring that life begins at conception. And uh, we, if you're available, you can come to the church here. The signs are available at quarter to two, and uh, they'll be distributed, and you can go out and uh, stand with your sign from two to three today. Appreciate uh, you working with us on that, and we do want to definitely send a strong message into our community on how we value human life. I invite Sven to come. God bless you. Sven uh, is coming to share a little bit about Gideon's or the new name for Gideon's. To share what a word, I'll let you share a little bit about Gideon and the upcoming banquet. Well, good morning. Gone. Okay, great. Okay, I'm here re representing the Gideons in Sault Ste. Marie. There are a few of us in the uh, local group here. We still do put Bibles in separate schools and in the motels in the city of Sault Ste. Marie. And we also uh, share the word around the world. So we used to be part of the Gideon organization out of the USA. And as part of that organization, the people in Canada were only allowed to go maybe one or two times in their lifetime on a trip to another country, and only men were allowed to go. So now that we're share word global, the husbands and wives can go together as many times as they want, and you don't have to be a member of the Gideons to go on one of these missions trips anywhere else in the world. Just to give you an update, uh, coming up this year, in the next little while, there's trips planned for Chile in November, in February, Kenya and the Dominican Republic. And next March, you can go to Nicaragua or Brazil. And then in April, you can go to Peru or Malawi. Or if you want, in May, you can go to Brazil or Nicaragua. So there's lots of choices there if you want to go on a trip. The uh, July, there was four people went from the Sioux. 
Uh, two were Gideon members, two were not Gideon members. So there's four people from the Sioux that went to Kenya or uh, Uganda. So uh, that's something that's available. And how many people attended the banquet last year in 2021? It was online. Oh. There was a number of speakers and presenters, and uh, our, our singer that was here, Rook Nichols, was the music for the banquet online. So it was much nicer to see her in church, though, or at the cross, wasn't it, than going online. So this year we have a banquet, and the nice thing for us is the banquet uh, is the same price as it was in 2019. So that'll be uh, 25 bucks uh, for a chicken and potato, roast potato and so on meal, which is pretty good. If you go to a store these days, you'll realize that you don't get much for 25 bucks in the grocery stores anymore. So here's a time uh, to share a time together. Now, the nice thing about the banquet is just like Bill Ainsley and Brenda Ainsley and KFM put on the cross where all the churches in the city get together in one place to share the love of Jesus, this is another chance once a year for the, all the churches in Sault Ste. Marie to get together and share in a common cause, which is getting God's word out into the hands of many lost people around the world. So uh, just to give you a last, during the pandemic, we had uh, over 35,000 people were mobilized to share the gospel in whatever area they were in in the world. Uh, there was about 425,000 gospel presentations put on last year. And we have about 14,252 church partners in Canada that uh, share in the ministry goals. And we gave out about two and a quarter million scriptures last year. So the pandemic really didn't stop the Gideons from doing their job. So anyways, I'd like to encourage you to come out and share the uh, event with us. It's on uh, Friday, November the 4th at 6 p.m at the uh, Marconi Event Center. It used to be known as the Marconi Club. And uh, everyone's welcome. And come out and enjoy a, a good meal and find out what's going on in the Gideon some more. So we encourage you all to support the Gideons. Without your support, uh, the Bibles just could not be given out. It takes money to give out Bibles. Last time I was here, I did mention that the former communist countries of uh, Nicaragua and Cuba, where Bibles were forbidden, decided that all the children in the schools of, in the whole country should get Bibles because uh, they thought that was what the country now needs. The politicians decided the anti-Bible didn't work for them, so they, the politicians are pushing to put Bibles in the schools. Now, politicians in Canada are going the other way, so we're having a problem there. But uh, basically, th there's opportunities there to get Bibles in all the houses which have children. You know. The, Children get the Bible, the Bible ends up in the house, everybody gets a chance to see it. So that's an opportunity that's open right now. We did have opportunities, by the way, in 2008, when the Olympics were in Beijing, China, all of a sudden, you could put Bibles in China. And when the Berlin Wall came down, all of a sudden, you could put Bibles in Russia. Those doors are closed. It's against the law. You'd be put in jail if you were caught putting a Bible anywhere in the country. So basically, doors open, doors closed. We have doors open now in many countries of the world. And it's up to us to support the Gideons and get those Bibles out there. So we do need your support, and we thank you for attention. Thank you, Sven. Appreciate that. <laughs> the children can make their way downstairs. For, of course, we have Toddler's Church for children ages 2 to 4, and uh, Super Church for children ages uh, 5 to 10. God bless you as you make your way downstairs. Your leaders will be waiting for you downstairs. You can take your Bibles with me and turn to Matthew chapter 28. And of course, we'll be looking at a few scripture verses this morning as we walk through our message today. We all know that Jesus had 12 disciples. We know that. You know what? I sometimes wonder why Jesus needed 12 disciples. Um, I mean, I think of the times, the amount of time he spent, spent explaining things to them over and over again. And I think, Jesus, maybe you could have done um, a lot better without these guys. I mean, especially considering the fact that Jesus, your God, it, it honestly just seems like the disciples kind of slowed him down just a little bit. 
And yet, for some reason, Jesus saw it as necessary to have these disciples, and even beneficial, more beneficial than if he did everything by himself. In fact, Jesus once said, he said, but truly, verily truly, I tell you, it is it's for your good that I go away. And in my mind, I'm thinking, as I'm reading that scripture, I'm thinking, Jesus, it's, it's for our good that you go away. I mean, you're going to let those, if you will, bozos lead, and they're going to be in charge of your kingdom. What in the world are you thinking? I mean, how can it be better to leave it with these 12 disciples? I mean, I, I mean wouldn't it just be easier for Jesus just to... Being, bring people to himself. Think about it. He could have gone from town to town preaching, and he would leave behind an army of new followers of Christ. I mean, why spend so much time with the disciples? Why did he choose to use these people? Why does he choose to work through us as his people? Well, it all comes down really to the idea of discipleship. Now, discipleship is just a fancy word for making followers of Jesus Christ, bringing people to Christ and helping them grow in their faith. We see this in a verse in Matthew called the Great Commission. Jesus is about to ascend to heaven, and he's gathered his disciples around him for a last message, and he says to them these words. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I commanded to you, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. When we read that verse, we typically, typically see it as a call to evangelism. You know, sharing your faith with the world around you, which is very true. But it's so much more than that. See, making disciples doesn't end when you, you say a prayer with someone. It's a journey of walking along with someone in their faith. Jesus spent three years with his disciples, training them and showing them what it truly means to follow him, to follow Jesus. He didn't say, you know, he didn't, he didn't just say, say this prayer and then, and then move on. No, he brought them into his life and he showed them the ropes. He trained them. And then he commissioned them to go out and to do the same. But why? But why? Why was that so important? Why was that better than if Jesus stayed? Well, well hear me out on this this morning. It's because spending time discipling is the best strategy there is for reaching people for Christ. Far better than if Jesus did it for, by himself. Do you believe me? Do you believe me? Let me show you this morning. Let's say I bring a person to Christ every single day for a year. How many people is that? You add it up. How many? 365 people, 365 days in a year, one person per day. Great job. 365 people. Can you imagine bringing 365 people to Christ in one year? You know, bringing one person to faith every day, 365 days in a year. Now, let's say I did the same thing every year for 20 years. I bring someone to faith every day for 20 years in a row. Well, what's that? All of you mathematicians, 20 times 365 is, yes, 7,300 people, 7,300 people in 20 years. And you know what? I did it all myself, by myself. And I could pat myself on the back and say, man, wow, am I, I'm wonderful. 7,300 people. But did you know that there's actually a more effective way? And what if I told you that I could actually reach more people by bringing only one person to faith a year? And it all has to do with exponential growth. You say, what do you mean by that? Okay, so what's the problem with the first method? Well, the, the problem is it's all about me. It's, it's, the, the pressure's all on my shoulders here. You know, I, I swing through town every day. I tell someone about Jesus, and then I leave. They accept Jesus into their life, and I sort of leave them behind to, to kind of figure out a Christian faith by themselves. 
All I've done is I've got them to say a prayer and give their lives to Christ. Now, that's great, but I haven't really shown them what it means to follow Jesus. I haven't. So instead of this new method, let's say I bring somebody to faith, but I spend an entire year helping them to, to the point where they can do something for somebody else. So sure, in, in year one, I'm a little bit behind. I just have one person, one person in that year. I led to Christ. I've discipled. I've invested in them. But now at the end of the year, there's two of us. And the next year, there'll be four of us, and then eight of us, and so on. Guess how many there'll be by year 20? It's not 7,300. It's actually over a million. Did you know that? Let me give you the exact number. Here it is. 1,048,576 people in 20 years. That's a lot more effective, and it's actually a lot more realistic. I don't know about you folks, but helping someone to grow in their faith is a lot more achievable than bringing 365 people to Christ in one year. This is what discipleship does. We're not called to just make disciples. We are called to make disciples that make disciples. That's what the kingdom calls us to. This is what made the early church just explode. And this is why Jesus spent so much time with his disciples. He did life with them. Following Jesus isn't just a solo experience. We need to do life with other people. Because if we don't, we're not really reaching anyone. We're we're producing really shallow Christians. That is why Paul instructs Timothy. Listen to what he says. He says, you heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now, he says, now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will pass them on to other people, making disciples who make disciples. Now, the only way you make disciples who make disciples is discipling them by doing life, by investing in other people. Not just by coming to church once a week and leaving without even talking to anyone. So if following Jesus, we get that in the back of our minds, isn't a solo experience. It involves investing people, allowing people to invest in us. It means doing life with others. Then what are the types of people that I need in my life to be an effective follower of Christ. Did you know that there are people, there are certain people that you need in your life if you're going to be an effective follower of Jesus? I'm going to tell you about them, three of them this morning. Today I want to outline the three types of people from the Bible that you need in your life if you want to be a good disciple, if you want to make good disciples. And so here's the first person that you need in your life. I need a Paul in my life. We all need a Paul in our life. Let me tell you about a man named Timothy. Timothy was a young pastor in the ancient city of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a very pagan city. It actually housed the temple of Artemis, where people from all over the Roman Empire would come to worship the Greek goddess. Now, Timothy had his work cut out for him, but he made the smart decision not to do life alone. Instead, he positioned himself under this great apostle Paul. Paul was a veteran. He was a church planner. He was an apostle. I see for Timothy, instead of trying to figure it out on his own, he chose to look to those who had gone before him for advice, for for counsel. For Timothy, Paul was a mentor to him. Someone who showed him the ropes, he taught and modeled what it meant to follow Jesus and make other disciples. And so Paul was a mentor to Timothy. This is the type of relationship that we all need in our lives. Now, we know that Timothy experienced many challenges in his role as a pastor. And without Paul there to guide him, he would have been able, I don't think he would have been able to do it on his own. You know, folks, there's an old saying that goes like this. It goes like this. It says, it's important to learn from your mistakes, but it's better to learn from other people's mistakes. You know, that's really true. 
But often we try to, through brute force, you know, force, force our challenges in life without realizing that the church, that there are people that exist that can help us in our journey of following Jesus Christ. If you're facing a brick wall in your life or in your spiritual walk, there are people in life, in the church, who have gone before you that can actually help you walk through your journey. You see, there's so much value in having a Paul in your life. And so what are some of the, the benefits of having a mentor? What are the benefits of having a Paul in your life? Well, mentors, of course, encourage us. Now, we know that Timothy you know, faced some discouragement in his life. We know this because of how Paul had encouraged him in his letters. Clearly, Timothy was facing some discrimination actually because of his age. People weren't taking him seriously because he was so young. And honestly, it was something that could have discouraged him. But watch how Paul comes alongside Timothy, and he says to Timothy these words in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on your youth, but set example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. See, with discouragement like this, it could have, it could have made... You know, could have, could have brought Timothy down, could have discouraged him. Paul was able to come alongside and inspire him. Paul said, don't let those people, in fact, prove them wrong. You know, set an example for them so they can learn from you. He says, I see something in you, Timothy. Let me tell you, the power of someone older than you coming alongside and saying, I see potential in you, and you'll get through this. It does more than you could ever imagine. And so mentors encourage us, but mentors will also guide us. Now, this is perhaps the biggest benefit of having a mentor, someone you can look up to. As a young person or someone who is new in the faith, when we're faced with the difficult situations and we don't know what to do, Having a mentor is invaluable. In fact, most of Paul's letters to Timothy is just instructing him on different situations. You know, going to someone older or, or farther, farther along in the faith for advice can help you avoid some huge mistakes. And so I want to ask you the question, as we think about this this morning, I want to ask you, who is the Paul? in your life? Who are you looking up to? Who in your life are you, you know, positioning yourself under to receive guidance and encouragement and maybe even sometimes cor correction? Folks, we all need a mentor. We all need a Paul. And so I want you to be thinking about that in your life. Who is your Paul? But we all need a second type of person in our life. I need a Barnabas. You need a Barnabas in your life. Now, who is Barnabas? Well, when Paul was first starting out in the faith, Barnabas was a key player in his life and throughout many of Paul's missionary journeys. Paul and Barnabas were like thicker than blood. They spent years together ministering to people across the Roman Empire, planting churches together, facing persecution together, telling people about Jesus. They were close friends that, that really needed each other. And so Barnabas was a peer to Paul. Now, when I say peer, I don't just mean acquaintance. I mean someone who is with you, a co-laborer in the journey of serving Jesus. Uh, similar to a mentor, a peer is someone who encourages you and challenges you in your faith. But they are somebody, they're, they're, they're some people who you actually do life with as you journey along. And they are generally at the same stage of life. You walk through the same kind of challenges, the same circumstances in life. And so the benefits of having that type of per person, peers support us, they, they challenge us in, in many ways. Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another, and so that's true. And so we need people 
that are working with us as we're serving Jesus and we're, and we're, we're doing things for God. We people, need people to walk with us that can support us and challenge us but also peers who will stand with us. Life is tough sometimes. Life is challenging sometimes. If you're doing it on your own, you're trying to follow Jesus on your own, it's very, very difficult. But peers will stand with us. Paul's life before coming to Christ was questionable. He was one of the biggest opponents to the cause of Christ. Did you know that? He actually used to persecute the church. And then all of a sudden, when Paul is claiming that he follows Jesus, now the other disciples are, are very skeptical about him. They're, they're, they're skeptical. They're not sure about it. And so watch how Barnabas comes alongside as he's facing the challenge, even of the church. In Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to 28, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. That's Paul. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But watch this, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. And so we see if it wasn't for Barnabas vouching for Paul, you know, if it wasn't for him, he may not have been able to join the disciples. It would have been harder to connect with that community. But Barnabas put his reputation on the line for Paul. He stood with him when others wouldn't stand with him. And so, folks, I would say to you today, don't try to do life alone. In life, we need peers who will stand with us through the life's challenges. We need Barnabases that will come alongside and support us. We need someone who is there to support us to go through the difficult times of life. But more importantly, we actually need to be a Barnabas to other people. We need to be willing to stand with our peers when they go through difficulties and not desert them as soon as they walk through tough times. Now, if you don't have a Barnabas or this type of community in your life, what steps can you take to connect I mean, are you just slipping in and out of service as well without connecting, without getting to know people, making no effort? Are you in a cell group? Are you serving in a ministry? Because it's in these settings where we see these types of relationships are forged. So here's the question I want you to think about this morning. Who is the Barnabas in your life? We need Barnabases. Who in your life are you following Jesus with? Who in your life are you standing beside, supporting through the life's challenges? No, no, these, these are the easier relationships, right? We all know that we should have friends that walk with us and people that we look up to that we can learn from. That's kind of obvious. But this next one is actually not so obvious to many people in the church. And not many of us actually do this. And so we talk about this other person that we need. I, folks, I need a Timothy in my life. And I would say to you that you need a Timothy in your life. We all need a Paul in our life. We also need to be a Paul to all the other Timothys that are out there. This is what Go and Make Disciples is actually all about. We need to be coming alongside others who are younger in their faith and doing life with them, helping them take them to the next step of faith in their development. Think about this, folks. Paul was a superstar. He was well-known and he was well-liked. He could have just stuck with what was working and focused on my ministry and my kingdom. He could have just focused on himself, as I said, on building his his own brand and building his own faith. But Paul realizes something that we often don't think about in the church, that it's not just about our faith that matters. It's It's about other people's faith, too. That matters a lot. And Paul eventually chose to mentor Timothy. See, we are not just called to follow Jesus We're called to make disciples who follow Jesus. And that's exactly what Paul did for Timothy. 
Paul, Timothy was a protege. While we all recognize the value of having a strong community of peers and mentors in our life, we often don't think about who we are actually pouring into ourselves. Do you realize that all the benefits that you receive from having a mentor in your life, you can actually give to someone else by becoming a mentor to them? That just as you need people pouring into your life, you also need to be pouring into other people's lives. This is what we are called to by Jesus. And by not doing it, we are actually robbing ourselves and people. We're robbing others of quality mentors in their life. That's the first thing we're robbing. And we're robbing ourselves of a vibrant faith with Jesus. Did you know that? You say, Pastor, what do you mean? If I don't pour into others, I'm actually robbing myself of having a, a, a vibrant faith? Well, that's a good question. Let's walk through it and give you an answer to that. Well, as I mentioned a few times back in 2010, Thelma and I went to Israel. In Israel, there are, you know, there were two seas, really, they're, they're really lakes, but they're called seas by, you know, people. There's the Sea of Galilee and there's the Dead Sea. And listen, they can, cannot be any more different the Sea of Galilee is this lush, beautiful lake teeming with life, sea critters. It's a gorgeous place to get in a boat and go out and, and visit. And just south of the Sea of Galilee is, of course, the Dead Sea. Now, the Dead Sea actually sits 400 meters below sea level, and its salt content is 10 times saltier than the ocean. You can actually, as I mentioned, you can actually float on the surface. We don't need to get into that today. So why is the Dead Sea so salty? Well, because it's so low, all the water that comes in from the Jordan River gets stuck in the sea, and there's no exit for it. And all this water and rainfall brings with it a bunch of salt into that sea. Since the water, water has nowhere to go, the salt just builds up, and nothing can live in there, and there's nothing living in the Dead Sea. The sea is actually dying, they say, because all the water that is in it gets evaporated, leaving even more salt in its place. In fact, now experts say that the sea could be fully gone by the year of 20, 2050. You see, without an outflow, the salt builds up and it actually kills all the life in that sea. Then there is the Sea of Galilee, which is not just filled by the Jordan River, but it flows from the sea as well. There's a constant flow in and out of the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's filling and flowing. And as a result, that sea is full of life. And folks, in our life, you could be like the Sea of Galilee or you could be like the Dead Sea. You could pour into others as people pour into you or you could just get filled and filled and filled all about me, all about myself, <clears throat> but never give to others. But you know what happens if you just take in and you take in and you never give out and you never serve and you never pour into others? You know what happens to your faith? It stagnates. It does. It stagnates. And so being a mentor actually is a way of keeping your faith alive. Listen to what Paul actually, Paul said, actually instructed Titus to teach others in, in behavior. Listen to what he says. He says, older women, likewise, are to be reverent and not slanders or slaves. Too much wine. They're also, watch this, to teach what is good and so to train the younger women. See, Paul doesn't stop with the older women just being reverent in behavior. No, he also included that they should pass that along to the younger generation. According to Paul, following Jesus is helping people follow Jesus. And, and, and that helps keep your faith alive and vibrant. So as you're giving out, as you're serving, as you're investing, that brings new life to your faith. But not only that, being a mentor, you know what else it does? It actually keeps our church alive. You say, Pastor, how is that? Well, now it doesn't take too much thinking to realize that if we're not raising up others, discipling the next generation, that the church is going to die. It doesn't take rocket science to figure that out. And Elam is not immune to this. Young people are leaving the church faster than ever. 
If we're not helping young people get plugged in to the life and the truth of Jesus Christ, one day there won't be a church. It's about investing in the next generation. You know what the common denominator is? I've been reading about this and thinking about this. You know what the common denominator for students who stick with their faith after graduation to say, Pastor, what's the common denominator? It's that someone in the church was doing life with them, was investing in them. You know what? Preaching a, a really good sermon isn't going to keep them. It's not going to keep people in the church. It's definitely not going to keep the younger generation in the church. It's not doing that, but knowing that you're, you're, you know, knowing that you're, you're pouring your life into younger people, it, it will make a difference. Students that step away or people that step away from the church, it is usually the ones that are not plugged in or they didn't, have a str- they didn't have strong role models, and they didn't have any mentors. Th- there was nothing keeping them in the church. There was no connection to the church, and so they left the church, and maybe the church didn't even notice. There was no one helping them set, you know, through the life's challenges, help them through and encouraging them, calling them, and sending them a card. There was no one willing to walk with them through their doubts of God, and so they left. And maybe no one noticed. This is way more important than we could even realize, folks. This is so important. So we all need to look at our lives and ask yourself the question, who can I mentor? Who in your life can be a Timothy to you? Who can you pass your faith on to? You know, newer people in the faith, a younger generation. Maybe it's a son or a daughter, a younger sibling. Maybe it's a friend who's fairly new in the faith. Maybe it's, it's, it's being involved in, in kids' ministry and being a volunteer and working with kids or working with youth. Maybe that's where you'd find that. Whatever it is, I want to, I want to challenge you to keep the next generation in your heart and in your prayers. It should be a passion. It should be a passion for us as a church. It will keep your faith alive, and it will keep the church alive as we're investing in other people and definitely rest, investing in a younger generation. Listen, folks, young people are looking for role models. And if, the, if it's not in the church where they find the role model, model it will be their friends it will be you know, on what they see on social media. They'll find their role models. It will be with what they watch in movies. And I was thinking about that a little while. I was thinking, I don't know about you, but a whole generation of young people who are being shaped and modeled by social media, that sounds pretty terrifying to me. That doesn't sound very good. We need to, let's come alongside the next generation. We need to be mentors. I'm here today because someone invested in my life. And if I had time this morning, I could give you names and places and things that have been done that have made an impact in my life. You never know the impact that you can make in someone's life by caring and giving and serving and taking time to call and send a card and saying hello and saying a few words to people and building relationships. You never know how far that will go. So reflect on your life as you serve Jesus. We're called to make disciples who make disciples. And ask yourself these questions this morning as we close this service off today, this message anyways. Who is your Paul? Who is your Paul? We all need someone to look up to. Who is your Barnabas? Who is kind of In the same place as you, you're working together, you're facing the same challenges, and you have a friendship, and they're there to support you in the journey. And who is your Timothy? Who are you pouring into? Who are you caring for? Folks, we can get so focused on ourselves and our own needs. Oh, how important it is that we take time to look around. Even newcomers that that are coming into our community and coming into our church, taking time to care and to invest, and even a kind word and a thought is so very important. Today's big idea as we conclude this message this morning, if I was to wrap this all up in a thought as we close today, here is what following Jesus is all about. You ready for it this morning? Following Jesus 
involves learning from those who've gone before us. We're learning mentors, living life with those around us, building relationships, being there for one another, and leading those who are coming up behind us. That's how we would sum it up, and those are the type of people we need. This is what Jesus means when he says, make disciples of all nations. And so, folks, this morning, that's my challenge for you, investing, caring, making disciples, making it a priority. One person, if I was to spend time with one person, and I cared for them, and I loved them, and I, and I, and I did all kinds of things to build relationships with them, and then as opportunities come, I share the love of Jesus, they find Christ, and I walk with them in the journey of becoming a disciple. That's what we're called to do. And that's what we should be doing as a church. And so let's pray together as we think about this this morning. The call that comes to us today is, uh, Lord, we, the call is, is to come, and Lord, to make disciples who make disciples. And Lord... This is about relationships, Lord. This is about looking up to people and building relationships who, from, with people that we can learn from. And this is about building relationships with people that can help us in the journey. And this is about investing in the next generation, Lord. Help us in this area. Help us to really make this our, our focus as a church, Lord Jesus. Yes, we want to win people for Christ, but we also want to disciple them so they go on to do the same thing. Help us, Lord, as we endeavor to fulfill the great commission of Jesus Christ. May we be challenged in our hearts with this today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
good to dwell with our soul because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And we're going to prepare ourselves for communion at this time. I'm going to invite you to take your emblems. And of course, if you're fairly new to the church and involved with these emblems, there are two flaps to it, just letting you know that. You take the first section off and you get to the wafer, and then the second one gets you into the juice. But listen to what Jesus said to his disciples before he went to the cross. He said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, we just take this time to thank you for your, your broken body. We thank you, Lord, even as the scripture says that by your stripes we are healed. We thank you, Lord, for paying the ultimate price and going to the cross for us that we would have life and life eternal, that we could be able to sing this song and know because we've invited you into our lives and you've cleansed us, Lord, that we it is well with our soul today. And so again, we thank you for your broken body, your body that was broken for us. And so again, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you, do with this in remembrance of me. And so let's partake of the wafer together. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me and so Jesus we thank you for your shed blood we thank you Jesus for the power of your blood Jesus as the Bible says if we confess our sins you're faithful and just to cleanse us and to wash us and so we're thankful for the cleansing we can experience because of your precious blood thank you for shedding your blood precious blood at Calvary for us that we would have life and life eternal In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, as we take our cups here, and saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Um, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so let's partake of the cup together. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this time again. We can come and just think about you and think about the cross and think about what you've done in going to the cross for us. 
we also recognize that one of the benefits that we enjoy as followers of Christ is that those of us that have committed our life to you, have invited you to come into our life, that you come in and you cleanse us, but you also give us the privilege of entering your presence and worshiping you and praying. And so, Lord, as we're in your presence and we take this time to talk to you, we take some time to remember some individuals in prayer. We think of a little Ava, who's Karen Smith's great niece, who possibly has meningitis, is in the hospital. We pray for little Ava. We pray you would touch her, you would heal her, you would restore her in Jesus' name. We would trust you for a miracle in her life. We think of Jan Thomas, who's at home, and just again in need of a touch from you, Jesus. Minister to her body, bring wholeness to her body, we pray in Jesus' name. We think of Tamara's nephew as we've been praying for a period of time for Phil. We pray that, God, that you would move and minister and heal him in Jesus' name today. We think of Diane, who's at home, in needing of a touch from the Lord. We think of Pam, who's at home, and we think of Judy Watts' cousins, just a number of people just in need of a touch from the Lord. We trust you with their lives. We trust you with their health. We pray that you would minister just a healing touch to them today. And many of us that have gathered in this place and online that are looking to you for family members and, and personal health issues and challenges that we may be facing, we come to you right now and we recognize that you're a God that hears and you're a God that responds. You're a God that cares. And so may we just recognize that and recognize your presence and your ministry in this place. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Stand with me this morning. And in closing, we're going to sing a great, great old hymn of the church, the old rugged cross. Let's sing it together. Let's worship. Some of our songs probably appeal to different generations. I recognize, you know, we have our Zetters and we have our Millennials. Probably some of our songs appeal to them. But I know that this song, for those of you that are boomers or builders here this morning, you're going to sing this with all your heart this morning. How many are thankful for the cross and what Jesus did for us on the cross? Amen. Let's sing this. And if it's new to you, sing along as we lead it this morning. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering. I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay. Blood so divine 
good to be in your presence again this morning. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the price that you paid on the cross in giving your life. And thank you for changing us and giving us a new life as a follower of Jesus. So thankful, Lord, for the day that we came into relationship with you. We began this journey, but oh Lord, we need one another. And we need to lean on each other. We need to invest and give and receive As a body, that's the way that it works. And so as we leave this place with your presence, may we connect with one another. May we care for one another. May we work as the body of Christ should work in giving life to other people that many people will not only come to faith in Christ, but become followers, fully discipled in the faith. We pray these things. Thank you for this time. Thank you for each person who's here. Bless us as we go. From this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. So I'll cherish the old rocket cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will Please.